Okay, welcome everyone. Glad to see you all here this evening. Um, and welcome to those of you also who are joining us from home via our live stream. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our University of Arkansas Press Spotlight author, Austin Barron Bailey. Austin Barron Bailey is a chief curator of Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. She leads the curatorial and collections management teams and is a key member of the strategy team overseeing curatorial endeavors, collection growth and preservation, and contributing to the development of new ex exhibitions and installations. She joined Crystal Bridges in July of 2019 following a six-year tenure as the George Putnam Curator of American Art at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Tonight, she'll be discussing the book, In American Waters, The Sea in American Painting. For more than 200 years, American painters have been inspired to capture the beauty, violence, poetry, and power of the sea in American life experience a wide range of modern and historical American artists and the ways the sea continues to be an inspiration to them. I would like to mention that Daniel from Pearl's Books is out just outside the door there in the lobby. If you're interested in purchasing a book, they are available for, for sale and Austin has graciously agreed to do a book signing right here at the back table as you come into the room. So keep that in mind if you're interested in that this evening. Thank you all for being here. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Austin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and hello to our virtual attendees of uh, the talk tonight. So this is an exciting opportunity to uh, both revisit an exhibition that was at Crystal Bridges in November through January of this past year, and also prior to that at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts from May through October of 2021. The book that accompanied the exhibition was a publication produced collaboratively between Crystal Bridges and the Peabody Essex Museum and published by the University of Arkansas Press. So I thought I would take you a little bit through the content of the exhibition and how we thought about expressing it as a publication and also give you a little bit of an insight into the essay and the new research that I produced um, as one of the authors on the book. So what you're seeing here actually is a picture of a view from the top of the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem, Massachusetts, looking out at the Salem Harbor uh, on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean and an aerial view of Crystal Bridges uh, where you see the Town Branch Creek flowing into the ponds. And I show these two because you might think, what does Crystal Bridges in a landlocked state like Arkansas have to do with the sea in American painting? Well, quite a lot, to be honest. There are many, many connections between the collections of these two institutions uh, that pointed to the significance of marine themes and subject matter in American painting. And in addition, all of the creeks and the waterways, and so here's a beautiful image of the William Truss Richards of the Atlantic Ocean with the crashing waves. This is in the Crystal Bridges collection, and a fabulous detail of the wave cresting, and you can see the translucency through. So these kinds of paintings sort of inspired the show. But this is just a little reminder of the fact that all of the creeks and streams and rivers in Arkansas make their way to the Mississippi, which flows to the Gulf and then you know connects to the wider oceans. And it's through these waters that we're all connected. Um, and so through the collections and through these geographical and sort of um, waterway connections, we sought to create um, ways to bring paintings like this uh, to our region. So when we began this project, the Peabody Essex Museum is famed for its collection of maritime paintings. There are, um, it is a specialty area within the museum. And these kinds of pictures of the Brig Salem in the upper left corner, or the Fitzhenry Lane of the Southern Cross painted in 1851 are the kinds of ways in which marine painting has traditionally been understood. And it's presented a fairly limited view of how to understand marine painting. This 
project and book represented an opportunity to think about what does it mean if you think about Norman Rockwell and portraits of um, an old sailor making a ship model for for a good boy. It's the, uh, the, care, the name for the little boy peeking up, probably looking at his grandfather making uh, this ship, but with all the hallmarks of what you might think of a marine character, the tattoo, the pipe, the parrot on the shoulder, adventures past, or pirates. This is a Howard Pyle image um, called Marooned. And uh, for those fans of Pirates of the Caribbean out there, there would be no Pirates of the Caribbean without How Howard Pyle. So this project was a way to think about how are some of the uh, marine themes and uh, characters in our imagination, how do they stem to objects of American art, um, such as this very transporting image uh, with the birds sort of flying away and the one wave cresting in this golden sort of deserted island. We also wanted to think about the ways in which ship portraiture, uh, the standard ways in which marine painting have been defined, could also extend to portraits of the people um, who owned the ships, captained the ships, navigated the ships. Uh, and this is a very rare example uh, by Charles Wilson Peale from a private collection in Philadelphia showing a ship captain in uh, his quarters on the ship. Uh, a very rare example with his, uh, you see the beautiful detail um, of his map and his instruments and even the anchors on his brass buttons of his coat. This was also a chance to really look at some of the uh, marine histories that uh, have not been uh, as widely recognized as part of our uh, thinking of marine traditions we were able to really foreground the role of black sailors in American history and in American naval history uh, from uh, the War of 1812 all the way through World War II. These two examples were both painted in 1944. The painting on the left uh, is showing an admiral, um, uh, and it was painted by Huey Lee Smith, an African-American painter. And the Admiral uh, is the man who worked with President Eisenhower on the executive order to desegregate the armed forces in 1948. And he sh this image is showing uh, the Navy as a path uh, out of poverty um, or uh, rural uh, life uh, and the opportunities afforded by the special training unit. You can see written on the wall of uh, the man gesturing to the chalkboard and teaching these courses. So this kind of the way that, that, that he, he creates the space as you move through and to create opportunities uh, through the Navy. And on the right, you see Jacob Lawrence in a portrait of Captain Carlton Skinner. And Captain Skinner uh, was the commander of the first integrated troop ships in World War II on which Jacob Lawrence served. Now, Lawrence was a very established, even famous artist by 1943 when he joined the Coast Guard, which served under the Navy during the war. And this is an homage to Captain Skinner, uh, who supported Lawrence's uh, appointment as a public, as a, a, as a unit in the, of public relations. Um, as a combat artist. And so Lawrence sailed all over the world on the USS Sea Cloud, which was a yacht that had belonged to Marjorie Merriweather Post. Uh, it had been recommissioned during the war um, so that uh, troop transport and aid to troops serving across the globe during the conflict uh, could be serviced. And so this uh, portrait uh, where you see Captain Skinner sort of hovering above uh, these troop ships um, and his ship illuminated almost like these sort of stars and insignia with all his rank and uh, stars and bars below is an important indication of how crucial the Coast Guard experience was to Lawrence who called his experience in the Coast Guard the greatest democracy I've ever known. Um, and so these two pictures allow us to demonstrate the importance of marine history uh, to the advancement of our national history. We also organized the show into several different sections. So portraiture was one, and we also had in port. And these map to the sections of the book. 
um, and the chapters of the book. Uh, but as you'll see, the organization of the book and the images themselves lay out differently um, as you flip through the volume. But this is a portrait um, by George, George Ropes of Derby Wharf in Salem, the launching of the ship Fame. Now today, you can find um, t there's the, the Salem Maritime Historic Site still exists, and there's a replica of this boat. But this is the moment when you see the full community coming together um, to celebrate the launching of this new vessel out into the world. So these stories of community, of celebration, of shipbuilding are all part of this exhibition. We also wanted to show um, the range of marine painting and the ways in which the oceans connect American history and experiences to the wider world. This is a picture by Reuterdahl, who was commissioned actually by President Theodore Roosevelt as the artist aboard the diplomatic Great White Fleet, which sailed all around the world in 1908. And here they are snaking through the Straits of Magellan. If you look to the far left of the composition, you can see what amounted to about 20 battleships um, that circ circumnavigated the entire globe on a goodwill diplomatic mission um, to demonstrate the kind of prowess of the US Navy um, it's standing in the world, um, and again, it's sort of diplomatic assertion um, of its role on the high seas. And then you have these incredibly elegiac uh, paintings. This is by Francis Silva, uh, where you see artists exercising their incredible technical skill inspired by these marine locales. So this is off the coast of Gloucester. You see this chromatic radiance of a sunset sort of moving from pinks and rose to gold and yellow. And the technical precision uh, of the sails, the geometries, the perfect symmetry um, of this in the center of the composition, the still waters, the little ripples on the waves. Um, in the 1870s. So he uh, based this on very careful observation on uh, m sketchbooks held in the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, and so you see that um, demonstration of expertise. And this is another way to think about marine painting. Where does the authenticity lie? Is it through technical ability to paint these objects? And or are you a sailor yourself? Do you have firsthand experience um, of the high seas the way uh, Reuterdahl did um, or Lawrence uh, sailing with the Coast Guard? So some of those tensions are interesting to think about um, how do we define marine painting and who is a marine painter? Here's another example of our section on voyages. This is painted by Teresa Bernstein in about 1923, reflecting on uh, her passage and the stories of immigration. Uh, she came from Poland and uh, as a young child, and it is very likely that the woman in the front holding the baby is uh, either a somewhat of a self-portrait or a memory of her mother. But you see here the community of immigrants coming up on the deck of the ocean liner um, to dance, to play music, to play games, to chat, to socialize, to catch fresh air. So the stories of where to even begin to tell the story of marine painting uh, can be found in immigration, uh, can be found in the Navy, and not just in uh, the paintings of boats uh, as portraits and records of vessels. The other ways in which to think about uh, marine painting are the dramatic and sort of dangerous aspects of the voyages. So the drama of the high seas. This is an early Washington Alston painting that had been on loan from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where you see this incredible swelling seas. Um, and these are sailors who are uh, about to be uh, rescued, uh, we think, by the ship uh, sailing towards them um, as they're in distress uh, with the passing storm and the rising waves. These are the kinds of um, depictions of the sea that have inspired um, many, many contemporary artists as well, and I'll come back to that. 
Another key aspect of the national histories was to think not only about immigration as a key way to think about marine painting, but also the transatlantic slave trade. And discoveries that we made during the exhibition include this painting by Clement Drew. Clement Drew was a little known painter of marine scenes based in Boston, but he lived on Beacon Hill, which was then an African-American neighborhood. Um, this is in the 1830s, and he became very involved in the abolitionist movement. And in fact, this painting was owned by an abolitionist leader, William Lloyd Garrison, and it is his daughter um, that donated it to the Massachusetts Historical Society from which we borrowed it. But what you're seeing here is this, this is called Wreck of the Ship Colonization. And the um, images and details on this next slide show you how he is creating an allegory of this wrecked ship of, of colonization. The ship is named Abolition. The, the flag uh, in the blue square says all men are born free and equal. Another pillar says immediate, eman uh, sorry, penance says immediate emancipation. And it says one country in the world, our countrymen are all mankind. And then floating in the the kind of stormy waters is a little barrel that says New England rum, which is implicating the New England states in the triangle trade or the dependency on the sugar cane, which was uh, harvested by slaves um, to produce the rum that the merchants um, traded and sold. So these are the kinds of ways to deepen our understanding of uh, American history and its connection to marine history. And then we also included many contemporary artists who continue to meditate on these themes in their work. This is a painting by Carrie James Marshall, who uh, is uh, actually been painting marine subject matter since the early 1990s. This picture, Baptist, features um, a figure floating in between Africa and the Americas, sort of displaced uh, the way you see fragmentation in water, um, and painted in his very distinctive uh, all uh, uh, sort of jet black uh, skin color, where he mixes seven different shades of grays and blacks and no whites to create this intense black pigment. Um, but what uh, you see here is this kind of suspension between worlds, be between be belief systems, and at this very high horizon near the eyes is this idea of baptism. So there is a sense of kind of cultural regeneration and rebirth um, through the experience of uh, moving from one continent and culture and set of beliefs to the next. Um, and even in the lower right-hand corner, you see that old-time religion is good enough for me. And in the right-hand corner, you see this sort of red cross symbol, perhaps symbolizing kind of an intersection or even a, an emergency or a crisis. So many layers of meaning and interpretation in a picture uh, like this, and even references to different religions. The seven ho hovering over Africa is a reference to the seven deities of the Yoruba religion. And the three over one is, of course, the Christianity uh, Trinity, the three in one. Um, I don't know what all the other numbers mean at the top, but those primary ones uh, signify these different kind of cultural belief systems and the ways in which contemporary artists um, are thinking about these traditions and legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, new beginnings um, and histories and the water, even as a place of cleansing and rebirth. So, um, my essay for the exhibition was an effort to really think about um, the horizon uh, as a region of interest, uh, that is the title of the essay, and to think about the ways in which um, the horizon and our its allure could sort of set up uh, the larger themes of the exhibition and cover a wide variety of material. So what you're looking at here is John Frederick Kensett's very last painting done in 1872 before he died um, where he's on the Connecticut uh, coast, an island, just looking straight out into the sea um, at this kind of vast limitless space with a glow of the sun there. 
we use this picture um, as a one of 175 paintings that in a combined scientific study with Harvard University and the Peabody Essex Museum to look at the neuroscientific ways that people um, actually see marine paintings. So what you're looking at here is a heat map of the 175 participants in this study and it is mapping their visual fixation on the painted image. And all of the yellow dots indicate the intensity and duration of their gaze at the picture along the horizon line. And this was quite consistent um, with the paintings in the study. So we wanted to really think about what that allure uh, could look like. In the exhibition, we actually had, so this is an, Im an image showing the uh, installation at Crystal Bridges, where you're seeing the Kensett painting next to um, an interactive that allowed people to explore um, the different studies of the horizon and to move uh, between the paintings and see where that, those heat maps um, really fixated. And on the right, you're looking at um, a painting by Felrath Hines that is a very abstract evocation of the horizon line. Um, he spent many, many uh, summers at the beaches of Chincoteague um, in Maryland. And it's a kind of abstract evocation of the layers of water, sand, sky, uh, even maybe like a leaden uh, cloud cover um, at the top. I just want to call up one thing here. We also wanted to really think expansively about um, the ways in which artists position themselves in relation to the horizon and changing horizons. This is an image on the left by Charles Woodbury, uh, who studied engineering at MIT and went on to have a very illustrious career as a kind of impressionist painter in Ungunquit, Maine. But early in his career, he was looking at theories of motion. And so the incredible sense of movement and this uh, horizon line off in the distance with the smoke of a passing ship um, was really trying to get at the modernity of this experience of Atlantic crossing, but also the physical expression of movement, motion, churning waters um, behind uh, the ship. This was, uh, critics really raved about this painting when it was exhibited, describing the foam as lacy, um, as, uh, you know, as transporting you to this journey and to the limitlessness of the horizon uh, left behind. So this idea of, of whether an artist is on the beach looking out at the horizon or at sea um, or even hovering you in space um, changes the ways in which we can understand the um, the experience of the horizon and our kind of physical and emotional relationship to it. On the right, you're looking at uh, Edward Moran's undersea painting made around 1850, just as uh, technology for the transatlantic telegraph cable um, is coming into being, and oceanography as a field of study uh, is being developed. And the, um, the colors here are not what anybody had actually really seen, except um, in some specimens that were harvested and shown in museums. But what he's done here is imagined the underwater experience just as if it were a landscape above water. So then the ways in which these artists are trying to understand marine space, um, oceanic space, um, becomes really uh, this is a very uh, unusual and rare uh, expression. One of the, um, one of my favorite paintings in the show is this Georgia O'Keeffe picture. And I did want to read um, a quote that um, I used to open my essay in the book um, where she said, I loved running down the boardwalk to the ocean, watching the waves come in spreading over the hard, wet beach, the lighthouse steadily bright far over the waves in the evening when it was almost dark. Running, um, running, watching, spreading, 
hard, wet, bright, far, dark. These are all of the words that O'Keefe uses and that you can see coming into formal expression here. She's completely flattened the space. And in a way, it's like there's three horizons. You have the, the wave, you have the kind of swell, and then you have the far horizon where you see that little bright spot of light um, drawing your eye to the center. And then this, this wave along a mauve covered sand. But this is one where her physical experience on the beach um, and on the beaches of York, Maine, where so many marine painters before her um, and after her will paint, um, connects her to these traditions and also demonstrates her very different orientation to those traditions and a complete reimagining of the experiential translated into a kind of abstract expression um, of a moment. I also thought it would be fun to show um, the Deben corn in the exhibition. And on the right is a tiny little uh, color proof um, that I'm holding up as part of the process of making uh, this book. Uh, when you are working on um, the project, your typed up manuscripts uh, get set into uh, pages by the designer and you work through an entire process where um, photographs get released to um, uh, color separators and then prepared as proofs, which then we compare to the original works of art to make sure the quality of the reproduction will be very high. Um, and so for this Deben Corn, um, and sometimes there are these extra approvals where uh, the estate, uh, the Deben Corn estate, has to approve the quality of the reproduction before it will um, allow the image to be released to the printer. Um, so this is uh, a really fun late part of the process um, when the book is about to enter production, when we were running around the museum, um, uh, sorry, uh, with the color proofs. The Deben Corn is a really incredible example of an artist um, who is pushing the limits of uh, what we could imagine as marine painting. This large picture is from his Ocean Park series, and it's one of about 120 pictures that he produced um, sort of responding to the light and the landscape of Santa Monica, California. Um, he was about four blocks off the ocean in a former sailmaker's loft, in fact. So even the scale, uh, this is um, a very, very large picture, um, almost eight feet high. And so even the scale of his works um, sort of correspond to the kind of monumentality of um, oceanic space. At the very, very top of this painting is a strip of blue, which is kind of like the horizon or an evocation of the sea nearby. So he's really pushed your eye all the way to the limit of this canvas. And in addition, his technique was to often paint on the canvas and lay out his composition, and then he would often scrape it off, sort of wipe it away and sort of start over, but the remnants of what was underneath would continue to form the layers of these canvases. So in thinking about the work in the context of marine painting, in the context of um, being in the sailmaker's loft and near the ocean, it's very tempting to think about um, the ways in which the water and waves sort of sweep away the sand, create a fresh start um, uh, with each passing wave um, as a kind of an analogous process to Deben Korn's technique, um, the influence of, of the ocean nearby on his practice. We also um, looked um, at artists who uh, used the sea um, either as a place of respite and rejuvenation or um, lived uh, at the sea. On the right is Arthur Dove, and we chose that picture for the back of the book. Um, and he lived on a houseboat in Long Island Sound and one night experienced a terrible, terrible life-threatening storm. Um, but uh, they battened down all the hatches and he was actually writing to his dealer, the famous modern uh, art impresario Alfred Stieglitz at the time of what was happening, um, of the colors that he could see, of the moon, um, of these kind of black stormy waves. And so here you almost lose sight of the horizon um, with these roiling black edged waves. And it's a kind of complete contrast except for the circular form of the moon to the Barclay Hendrix on the left. 
Barclay Hendricks was an African-American painter who was famous for very stylish, large-scale portraits of uh, black people and uh, celebrities and models. Um, but every year for about 20 years, he went to Jamaica in the winter. Um, he left his portrait world behind, and he, he called Jamaica his healing place. And he could make a painting, as he said, in a day. And this is a little, I think I have a gallery shot of this um, in a minute. This is a little kind of porthole painting. And so these beautiful chromatic colors, the importance of that horizon and this framing was very intentional. One of the reasons he chose round is that it mapped to all of his uh, seascapes were round or oval. And that shape is the same um, field of vision of the human eye. And so he was very interested in sort of how we see, how we look, um, and created these these gorgeous decorative frames to go with them. So this one sort of takes you out all the way to the edge, but you never lose sight of the frame. So it's a very sophisticated um, way to think about the sea. Here's some more of the color proofing um, where we're comparing the cover to the works hanging in the galleries. Um, and where we are, um, we've sort of done a couple of rounds on the right you're seeing, um, looks great, well done, just, a, just overall got a little too dark because all of these adjustments uh, can be made. Even on the left, we're seeing really close, just needs more blue overall, asking for me more detail. So these, um, and then we're like, okay, if, it's, if it looks like it's ready to go. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the behind the scenes of the making um, of these books. Um, and uh, as you see here um, in the book, each of the pictures often will get their own plate or um, sometimes we do, we're very intentional about thinking about which uh, paintings uh, pair together um, just as we would in the galleries. But the physical uh, expression of the book and of the ideas is completely different. So for example, here you're seeing um, the Deben corn on its own spread, but in the gallery we were able to really have fun with scale and place that that tiny Barclay Hendrix um, and the beautiful blues and turquoises that you see in both pictures nearby each other, um, and so to create a special kind of moment. This is um, the William Tross Richards um, next to a Norman Lewis. Now Norman Lewis was um, a black painter who traveled to, who was a merchant seaman. He, he um, spent several years as a merchant seaman early in his career um, and spent the 1960s doing very uh, politically engaged work that dealt with uh, racial violence and the Ku Klux Klan um, and those experiences and events of the 1960s in his art. In the early 1970s, he uh, cre began uh, creating a body of work that he called Sea Change, and it literally was a sea change in his art. He traveled to Greece, and he spent uh, extended time in Greece and would uh, take very, very long walks along the coast, and he wanted to really think about um, different ways to express the roiling sea um, and the kind of metaphorical uh, fields of color of atmosphere um, and of energy um, in his work. And so this painting um, hung just a little ways down uh, from the William Tross Richards uh, in the exhibition, um, but not just, not right next to each other. So um, ways that we were thinking about horizon and waves, we didn't end up actually being able to show in the exhibition, but I wanted to make that point for you about how he was looking at that wave line. Um, and how differently and um, how modern and, uh, it was compared to uh, more realistic and naturalistic examples. These same wave motions have inspired an artist like Clifford Ross, who is a digital artist. And uh, this was um, a motion uh, single piece. You're seeing three versions of, uh, it's really just one panel. But Clifford Ross uh, is someone who essentially is using digital pixels like paint. And he thought of the LED screens almost like a canvas weave and studied the motion of waves and thought how could he kind of paint waves in motion and create uh, an ever unfold, unfurling digital wave um, through these tiny pixels where he could adjust the color, the hue, the intensity, um, brightness of the light 
Um, so this was a really dramatic um, moment in the exhibition um, where uh, an image uh, in a book or on a PowerPoint uh, cannot quite do justice to the living um, motion of the real piece. And here you're just seeing the ways in which we um, installed some of the pictures. Um, we had a little modern moment with the O'Keefe and the Dove um, bracketed by um, a Will Barnett on the left um, and the Norman Lewis on the right to get a sort of pop of color um, with these beautiful sort of blue greens and grays of the other works. <clears throat> One of the last sections of the exhibition um, was called um, uh, Beachcombing. And uh, beachcombing uh, was actually a word that developed in the 19th century to apply to sailors who jumped ship um, and would kind of ingratiate themselves into local cultures and um, kind of glean different things from that culture and kind of um, sort of make their way. Um, uh, sometimes uh, unscrupulously. Today, beachcombing, of course, um, implies sort of recreation, strolling on the beach, and um, this is a painting by Marsden Hartley of one of his beloved beaches in uh, also near York, Maine, where O'Keeffe was, um, but during World War II. So um, he lamented that during the war, um, people stayed away from the beaches. There had been German U-boat sightings, um, and these beaches were patrolled by uh, the Coast Guard and also citizens um, who helped patrol all of uh, the beaches and the perimeters of the United States during World War II. So you see this sort of black sky and the uh, kind of torpedo-shaped cloud um, and these beautiful um, touches of white impasto kind of on the edges of the cresting waves and no people whatsoever. Um, so these, these paintings that sort of could be read very simply actually do connect to larger histories. This is a K walking stick um, also uh, made in the main area. Uh, and it is um, a reference to um, the, she's also someone who spent, she's a Cherokee artist, and she spends um, the fall, the off seasons, on the beaches um, of New Hampshire and Maine. And so this is looking um, out at uh, the rock jetty um, with a Penobscot uh, basket motif sort of overlaid in the lower right corner. And it's actually two uh, diptychs where she pushes them together um, to create a larger canvas. And you see this wonderful kind of scattering of black rocks um, in the front to sort of balance the crusting waves on the right. Um, but for her, um, these waters um, connect to the Wabanaki people of Maine. They connect to um, sort of uh, the, the, the long presence of the ocean and the peoples um, uh, of these lands. And so this painting for her is an evocation of all of that layering of experience. Uh, at, the, at the water's edge. And of course, her wanting to try her hand as a major contemporary painter um, at the seascape. And this is one of uh, Crystal Bridge's more recent acquisitions, Amy Sherald's Precious Jewels by the Sea. So these four youths are standing um, in a very monumental uh, canvas. This is 10 feet tall. Um, and the, uh, the beauty of this, the tenderness of this, um, it's sort of this fleeting moment um, of these youths standing on this perfect summer day. Um, for her, this painting is a kind of expression of freedom um, and a sense of kind of, kind of a, a statuesque classicism also, where again, as a portrait artist um, and someone who thinks about representing uh, African Americans in her art um, and in their daily lives to create something like this on a monumental scale for a museum um, is a way to um, insert this imagery and the quality of this art into the canons of art history. And so um, when we had the opportunity to acquire this picture for the museum, um, the fact that it could be included in, in American Waters was a strong uh, reason for us to, to collect the work. And if you have the chance to go to the museum and see it, um, there's incredible details of uh, the turquoise water 
the still life elements of the grasses and the shells. Um, she even signed it on the picnic basket. There's a little brass plaque where it's her, uh, uh, it's called Shemberton, and it's her last name, Cheryl, and that of her uh, partner, um, uh, Pemberton, uh, put together. And uh, so little details like that to be discovered. But she also uses these incredible grays and browns to get these unique skin tones and then she's offset those with these jewel like colors um, and patterns and cuts and when you're there too you'll just see how uh, carefully she's painted the hands of the boys on the girls and the sense of uh, these very kind of calm and poised attitude um, and then the way their feet are in the sand and it's just a beautiful uh, painting that unfolds and, and kind of invites very close looking over time as you kind of marvel at these at these young people. And you can see a sense of the scale here with the um, painting and with the K walking stick in the distance. And on the right, is, uh, on the left, is a, a, another John um, Frederick Kensett um, of um, a beautiful beach scene where you see a very similar kind of cresting wave to um, to the K walking stick. But this painting, I think, really captures um, the spirit of the show of um, the, and the experience of most of us if we have the experience of the sea, which is to be on the beach, looking out, contemplating um, all of the stories and thinking about the, the kind of beyond um, the sort of aesthetic, the symbolic, and the conceptual meaning of the horizon um, and all of the histories uh, connected therein. I think that was my last slide. Yeah. And so this, the book, I think, really was a way to um, survey an, a, a very broad topic, um, making careful selections, um, hard selections of, you know, out of hundreds of paintings, we selected 92. Um, that could be uh, in the exhibition um, from lenders all across the country, and then figuring out how to organize it um, into sections that would tell a story, an experiential story of marine painting. So the experience of the exhibition was fleeting, you know, three months in, in Salem and, and three months in, um, in Bentonville. But through the book, uh, we really tried to um, you know, use design to um, lay out like the towering figures here, the table of contents with all the different sections, and select that even if you were not to read all the essays, by flipping through, you can get a sense of the um, the images and the flow, um, and give a, get a sense of the variety of the artworks um, in the exhibition and the range of style, time period, and artists who created marine painting over really about three centuries represented in this show. So I hope that you, if you got to see the exhibition at Crystal Bridges, you can relive it through the book. And if you didn't, you will have some sense of the scope um, by reading and flipping through the book. So thank you. Happy to take any questions. Yes. This is the hardest part about uh, putting this show together, given how broad the topic is and how many different ways artists represent the sea in America. Definitely narrowing uh, the thematic sections and thinking about which were the best works to tell the story of the most dominant themes that we identified. And we had the additional challenge of COVID, uh, in terms of this being an author talk and the experience of being an author, this, my essay and introduction and chapter on beachcombing um, in the book, which I co-wrote with um, Daniel Finnamore, uh, were all done during lockdown in a tiny little you know, alcove uh, at home. Uh, but we had to make some severe cuts to the checklist as a result. We had to cut about 30 paintings, um, which probably ended up being great, um, so the show wasn't too large. But, um, and we um, 
so thinking about how to kind of reorganize and rejigger sections um, with those constraints of um, budget and schedule were also um, factors. Yes. Tell us about borrowing works. Was it difficult? To gather them, and I guess they're all back home now that the show's over. Yeah, now that the show's over, um, Crystal Burgess lent eight paintings, and Peabody Essex lent, um, ten to, I think, about 12. And so that was pretty exciting that, um, you know, a good portion, a good percentage of the checklist was from our two collections. And um, to borrow pictures from other museums, it's really, uh, we try to see everything in person. So you make visits to the collections. And sometimes if you have a team, we had a team really of four curators working on the show. So some can see some and some others, and you have to kind of establish your criteria. Um, and then there's a formal process to request the work. And you hope you're successful. You hope it, that the museums are in the business of lending uh, works in a perfect world. Um, so to borrow is um, expected, to receive requests to borrow is expected, but sometimes the works are too important. Um, a, a museum may feel that they, that they can't part with it, or it's already being used uh, in another exhibition, or it may be too fragile. So evaluating all those considerations is a huge part of the, ex uh, of the negotiations and the request process. Um, but most, uh, there were very few works that we requested that we didn't get. And we also, for works that we knew would be uh, too hard to get, we uh, either found out in advance or kind of went in other directions. So um, you kind of survey the scene in that, in that respect as well. What about the expense? I know we would have to pay some transportation and security. Do you actually pay the museum to kind of rent it or do you, are they? Sometimes, they, sometimes museums, um, museums will often charge small fees to cover kind of administrative costs of preparing a loan. Um, sometimes those are waived. Um, but the biggest expense for um, transporting works of art is uh, creating and shipping. And insurance is part of it. But when you are putting together a major exhibition, all of those um, numbers are built into the budget um, and are part of the cost of the exhibition. Um, and for a project like this that was co-organized, um, we share those costs. Yes. Um, what are your three most favorite works on the show? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I really do love that Georgia O'Keeffe painting that I showed. Um, I let's see, there's one that I didn't show that I really liked. It was um, a painting by Marguerite Zorak of Diana, an American Diana. Um, I didn't have a picture of that. Um, I do love this Kensett. I think that the water is incredible. It's very transporting. There's this incredible sort of geometry as the um, the kind of beach curves into this point at the edge of the rock. Um, and uh, when you are in front of this painting, there are incredible details such as the smokestack. There's a little boat. You can see a tiny gray line of smoke. Um, uh, so that's really kind of amazing. And um, what would be my third favorite? There's so many beautiful pictures. Um, that little dove is pretty amazing too. I tend to love the, the modern pictures. Um, so I'll go with the O'Keeffe, the Kensett, and the dove. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope that gave you um, a taste of the show, um, entices you to take a look at the book um, and learn more. Thank you.